I want to, uh, today, I, I want to, uh, I didn't, in, I don't intend for this to be a history lesson, but there's parts of it that will be. What I do want to do is this week, next week, um, I want us to go deeper into the gospel. I've been talking for some weeks about what does it mean to be a disciple. And the last time I was up in front of you, I was speaking at a personal level. What's it mean, you know, at a personal level to be a disciple? What I want to talk about this morning, though, is really we, and and maybe maybe most of us don't um, don't see it like this, or um, you know, ha have seen it but have moved on, but. The story of Jesus' incarnation is not just an isolated event that happened on a certain calendar date that God shows up. And you might say, well, why, why did he pick this date? Why, why, you know, if Jesus was going to come back, why didn't he, when it, or come, why didn't he come on this date? Why that date? And it's easy to begin to without understanding the, the history behind what was actually going on, Jesus was incarnated when Yahweh said, I'm going to do it. And it wasn't by, well, I could do it tomorrow, I could do it. No, no, it, it wasn't that. And there's a couple things that I, I don't have time today to go into all this. I hope to be able to unpack some of it a little bit over the weeks ahead. There's several key things when we look at Jesus and we look at the Jewish community that he was born into and we look at the political environment that was going on in that, in that time and all of a sudden certain things that Jesus says in the gospel start to make much more sense he wasn't randomly throwing out neat ideas. He wasn't walking around town as the public sage that, oh, let's go find Jesus. He's always got cool stuff to say. Jesus, come on, say something neat today. What's a new parable today? That's not what he was doing. Um, and so... We need to be able to get to this place where we go deeper into what, the, what was actually happening, who Jesus actually was, what he was thinking when he showed up. I don't, I, you know, maybe this is something that you've never pondered at all, but, and I submit it really as a question because I wasn't there, so I don't know that I have the answer either, but I have some thoughts about what the answer might be. Did Jesus walk around like you and I with ideas coming into his brain and then those ideas that come into his brain, some pass out the other side and others all of a sudden take a deeper, a deeper root in his heart? Did Jesus begin to look at scripture and now see himself in Zechariah? see himself in Isaiah? Or was all that stuff kind of put in afterwards to make Jesus look like Jesus? It says that Jesus grew in who he was. It says that he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. I think that there's far more humanity in Jesus than we at a glance give him. So you might be saying, so you're telling me that when Jesus was born, he knew everything about what he was going to do and when he was going to do it and how he was going to do it and why he was doing it. 
and he just had to wait for his body to catch up with what was going on on the inside. Maybe. I tend to think that the two worked together. That at 12, when he goes back to the temple and he sits down with the rabbis and he begins to have discussion with them, I think the conversation was a conversation with a 12-year-old. But a 12-year-old that was already connecting with what revelation and understanding actually look like when they flow from heaven to earth. Maybe in the midst of that, Jesus discovered things in that conversation in the temple that, that now became revelation to him because of the conversation. I mean, how many of us, you know, you sit down, you start talking to somebody, you don't really, you, know, you may not have a lot of expectation, but as the conversation starts to unfold, all of a sudden stuff starts clicking inside of you going, oh, yeah, that connects to that. That connects to that. That's because of that. I'm not taking his divinity away. I just want us to see his humanity. So as we're, as we're starting to unfold this, there's, some, there's a couple of things that were going on. Uh, to be a Jew in the time that Jesus was born, that time wasn't a happenstance time. Daniel had already set the season. Daniel had already spoken what was going to happen. For, for the Jew of Jesus' day, the three books, that or portions of the books, that were the foremost in, in all of a Jewish person's mind was the book of Daniel, in particular chapter 7, the book of Isaiah, the poems from about... Uh, chapter 46 through 66, and portions of Zechariah, the poems of Zechariah. Those three sections of scripture were foremost in what was happening and being talked about. The rabbis were talking about it. There was a lot of things that, it, that were going on, but Daniel was the key. Daniel actually gave the timeline so that if I was living in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, there's, there was always debate about, is it this year or this year? But, you know, I mean, even, even now, when the year 2000 came, there was debate that went on, is it 2000 or is it 2001? We still haven't gotten the calendar right. So for the Hebrews, they were, they were still looking. The, the rabbis were looking. They were debating what was going on, but they knew it was within a window that Daniel had given, and it was a precise window. And the window also spoke about things that were precisely going to happen. That somehow there was this collision that's coming, one between the last great empire of the planet. When was that going to collapse? And so there was all the discussion about that. It also tied into when was Israel going to be liberated? She had been under the oppression of various governments and oppressors, but Rome being the one that's there now. Interesting, this is kind of an aside maybe, but I, I read in, in several commentaries that when, when Rome first came into Palestine, and began to occupy that area. Um, Augustus was the um, ruling Rome, Caesar Augustus. Of course, he was murdered. And when he was murdered, Octavian became the next Caesar. Caesar Augustus was the last ruler of the Republic. When Octavian took over, the Republic was dead. And Octavian was now Caesar, God, and ruled that way. And then you watch the history of Rome and, and all that went into that. Well, as 
that was all unfolding, the, er, the Jews in the beginning actually thought Rome would be a pretty good alliance when it was a republic, that Rome would come and be strong enough to keep their enemies away and let them do what they needed to do. Except, like when we were in um, Austria, the, um, uh, um, no, we weren't in Austria, we were in, yeah, we were in Budapest. We were asking, I got talking to one of the guards and there was a big, uh, big um, statue on what they call Liberty Hill and it's kind of their statue of liberty. And he said, when the Nazis occupied Budapest and finally the Russians came in and drove the Nazis out, we were celebrating and we saw this as being liberated because the Russians had finally driven out the Nazis except the Russians never went home. And we found out ultimately that they were as bad as, if not worse, than the Nazis that they had driven out. Israel saw some political advantage through Herod the Great of connecting with Rome and saw Rome's resources as helping them. Except when Augustus was gone and Octavian was now ruler, it was not better. And Rome only tightened its squeeze and became harder on them, and now it is an occupying force. I said, for those of you that go, I hated history in school, and I didn't want to go to church for a history lesson. I just want to stick, I'm going to be gentle, but I, because I could go a lot further. I just want us to catch the, the atmosphere in Jerusalem that was going on. So for, so for a Jew, I'm, I'm hearing and talking about Daniel and the prophecies of Isaiah and the prophecies of Zechariah, and those are all being talked about and, and they're, they're being uh, uh, read in synagogue. The rabbis are talking about it in synagogue. When I go to temple, it's what they're talking about in temple. And, uh, and, and we'll talk a bit, little bit more about temple in a bit. But it's an interesting thing that for, so for a Jew, and the reason why I put this up here and then I realized I probably should have made it bigger. We, the, so, um, so let's back up now to Exodus. The story of Exodus is the central story in Judaism. We were oppressed, we cried out, God came, delivered us, brought us out of captivity, ultimately brought us to the temple through King David. I know it was built by Solomon, but David paid for it. Um, and so in Jewish thinking, there is this, we always think about the Exodus. We think about that time of deliverance. And every year at Passover, what do we do? We tell the story. We relive the story. It's forefront in me being a Jew. It's that God, even when I'm oppressed, even when I'm, I'm enslaved, even when the, 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 um, all evil is coming against me, there is a point where I cry out to God, and in my cries to God, God hears, and when he hears, he comes. And when he comes, I'm delivered, and he brings me back to temple. And ultimately, in coming back to temple, the, the thing that I'm doing is the temple needs to be cleansed. Why? The, we, we, especially in Western culture, but probably in a lot of other cultures now, too, we've lost any connection with what is of historical importance. Probably most of us in this room, if tomorrow the, 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 the capital of the U.S., the capital building, fell apart and didn't exist anymore, we would just go on living. Some of us might think, well, that would be an improvement if it falls in while they're there. <laughs> but it wouldn't affect us. We don't see areas as sacred. We have a hard time finding anything that we call sacred. 
you know, the whole point of holiness. What's sacred? What's holy? What, what is central in my life that is so non-negotiable that it becomes holy? If I'm a Jew, Passover is one of the three feasts. It's holy. I'm required with everything that's within me to try to get to Jerusalem for this feast. It's part of what makes me a Jew. We sit around the table and we tell the story of the liberation. We tell the story of God the creator coming and once again taking over and being in charge. And it happens through us, the Jewish people. And so at this time, as we're, as we're looking at what's unfolding in Passover, and don't turn off like that again. What's unfolding in Passover, the, the, for the Jewish person, and when it comes to temple, this is what, we, this is what they saw. And this is their eschatology. If we're going to talk about, if I can use that term, you know, if this is a, a Hebrew's eschatology. It's that there's heaven and there's earth. In between these two circles is an interconnecting circle, and that's temple. It's not heaven and earth. It's heaven and earth and the temple. And the temple is where God dwells because he said, I will dwell there. We don't think in terms that God shows up for Passover and then goes back to heaven for another, you know, three months. And he's like, oh, yeah, Day of Atonement's coming up. I'm going to have to go back to the temple. So he runs back to the temple for the Day of Atonement. That's not how a Jew thought. God dwells in the temple. That is heaven and earth. That is the, the interconnecting place of heaven and earth. God, I mean, we've talked about it today. We've sung about it today. God, not over there, God here. And everything I do is in the anticipation of that. And when the temple becomes corrupted because of leaders, because of whatever, then God will rise, raise up someone who will come as the liberator and as the liberator will set us free. But the first thing in getting, when we get set free, is we must cleanse the temple because that's where God dwells. So the temple, the building, it's not just a building. Early maps, uh, Israel, or uh, Jerusalem, in early maps, Jerusalem was drawn as the center of the world. And if Jerusalem was drawn as the center of the world, the temple was the epicenter. So for the Jew, everything was about temple. Why was temple so important? Because God's come, that's where he dwells, and ultimately he's wanting to reveal himself as the creator God to all his creation. It's interesting early on when you read through, and we won't do it today for time's sake for sure, but when you read through some of the earlier scriptures about uh, temple and God coming, what God's view is, I want the whole world. Ultimately, the Hebrew view, which became the Jewish view, was God wants us. So everything then stopped being a worldview and started to become a cultural view. God is for us. God's going to come and liberate us. God's going to break the, the, the bonds of those that are holding us in captivity, and he's going to set us, the Jewish people, free because he's our God. When, in fact, God brings them, the Exodus story is God brings them out of Egypt, brings them to Mount Sinai and says, I got this amazing plan. You're going to be my people. I'm going to be your God. I'm going to set you in a land. And in that land, I'm going to, I'm going to be present in you. And I'm going to speak to you so that all the world, all the earth sees my glory. And the nations will come here to hear me and to talk with me and to have encounters with me through you, my people. God was all-inclusive. 
What the Hebrews heard was, you're our God. And their eschatology began to reflect that. So now we have the temple. I'm back in, you know, so we, we go from Exodus, we go to Mount Sinai, and of course we all know the story. God came, had a great plan, was all happy, ready to have a party, and they went, ah, no, 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 we, we ain't buying in. So God goes, all right, well, just saying, my plan hasn't changed. So all of a sudden, Jesus, in one of the parables, says there was a man that was going to have a wedding, and he sent out invitations to all his friends to say, come to this wedding. And they all said, no, nah, I can't. I'm too busy, not interested, you know, everybody. And so then finally, the father, in frustration, says to the servants, then do this. Go out into the streets, go out into the highways and invite and compel them to come. And they came. And Jesus goes on to say, and in the midst of the party, he looked around, the father looked around, and there was one person there that didn't have wedding clothes on, wasn't dressed for the party. It's a black tie event. They looked like me. And the father said, throw that one out into the outer darkness. You're gone. He was talking to the Jews. Because the father said, I came to you and said, I want, I have not changed my mind. I want to do what I wanted to do at Mount Sinai. But I'm done with the way we've been doing things. And so, by the way, I just showed up. And when I showed up, I'm now in charge. And they didn't like that. On another day, Jesus told the, the parable of the, the father, and he had, he had his vineyard and all the laborers in the vineyard. And so he sends a servant, he says, collect what's due me. And they go. And, and they beat that servant and send him away. So he sends another servant. And they beat that servant or kill him, I forget, without going to the story right now. But they do that servant harm as well. And finally, the father says, well, then I'll send my son. Because if I send my son, they won't do to him what they would do to a servant. But when the son shows up, they go, oh, wait a minute. That's the son. If we kill him, then the vineyard is ours and the spoils belong to us. So they killed the son. Those were the Jews. This is not a pro-Nazi thing I'm saying here. Yeah, just for the record. I'm just talking historically. And I want us to start to see Jesus in the Gospels was absolutely confrontational to the Jewish system every day. All the parables weren't just random stories that, that could get him in other people's books like Jesus was a good, good moralist. No, he wasn't. He was the son of God. So the temple, the way the Jews saw it, the temple is where God dwells. This is the interface between heaven and earth. The two are not separated. They are actually brought together in the temple. And what happens in the temple is God's dwelling there, and he's establishing his rule on the earth. So in the, from the, again, as a Jewish person, from it, within the temple, it's where his glory is. It's where his, the, the tabernacle presence, the Shekinah glory rests. Um, most of us in Western thinking, we think God lives in heaven, and, and the whole gospel story is repent of your sins, get saved, so you can go live in heaven with God. For a Jewish person, we're not trying to get to heaven to live with God. God already lives with us on the earth. They're not 
There's no chasm between the two. There's no separation between the two. He is the creator of heaven and earth. And he dwells in it all. <laughs> and he's given us this invitation to dwell there with him. Not separated from him. Not waiting for this thing called death to somehow be the liberating angel. So it's not that the Jewish people were just attached to their land or just attached to their, their temple, like maybe us in the U.S. would say, yeah, I, you know, I got my American flag up, and yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm proud to live in the USA, and all the songs that we sing about that. It was deeper for them. It was thousands years of history. I mean, for crying out loud, I mean, in the U.S., we can't even do Fourth of July or Memorial Day right. They are supposed to be days of remembrance, not hamburgers, hot dogs, and going to the beach, of which I do all three. <laughs> just saying, I'm not guiltless in this thing. I'm just saying they're not deep days of remembrance for me. They've never been part of my family culture. Maybe the closest thing we get as a family is Christmas and Easter. Thanksgiving, okay, we'll do three. We have three high holy days. And the main reason we get together is not to do remembrance, not that the Father, whoever the Father is, leads us in a remembering of our history that's over a millennia. At best, we get grace. At worst, we just eat. Right? But if I'm a Jew, it's very, very different. When they do the Haggadah, it's, it's, they all do it the same. It tells the same story. And if I'm a Jewish child, at, at this age, I start learning the story. I start participating in the story. I'm actually looking forward to the time when I'm entitled to either recite something or sing something in the course of the story. And over and over and over again, it's ingrained in me who God is and who I am. Jesus shows up. So Jesus shows up. He, he comes. So the buzz on the street is Messiah is due to show up. Maybe this year, maybe next year. You know, the, the, the last line in the Haggadah, or what the Jewish people say at, at um, Passover, the last line of that is there is a cup that's set for the return of Elijah. And that, that place is always empty at the table, and the cup is set. And the father at the table will always say, and next year in Jerusalem. Because it's the living hope of every Jewish person. Not next year that I'll buy a flat in Jerusalem and get to, get to live there. That, that's, it was much deeper that next year in Jerusalem, next year Yahweh has come and has redeemed his people and the enemies are vanquished. And we are now where we are rightfully supposed to be at the epicenter of the world next year in Jerusalem. And you, you kept that going. You kept that going. You kept that going. So here comes Jesus. And he starts talking like he is God. He starts talking like he is the temple. Well, wait a minute, you can't be the temple. Because if you're the temple, that means God dwells in you. He didn't dwell in you. He dwells in that, in that brick and mortar behind me. <laughs> Throughout the gospel, Jesus goes about doing good, healing all that were oppressed by the devil. 
every miracle that he did said to the people that saw it, God isn't in the, isn't in the temple, he's in that man. And Jesus said, yes. And that put him on a direct collision course with the powers that be both politically and religiously. And it makes sense that when they looked at him, the only plan they could come up with, just like the parable that he told, we got to kill the son. Because if we kill the son, then the spoils are ours. If Jesus is the temple, as he says that he is, then he is the interlocking circle of heaven and earth. Every time he walks up to someone and says, arise and take your bed and walk, heaven just moved into earth and earth shifted because heaven was there. When he stood at the, at the grave of Lazarus, he said, Lazarus, come forth. Death yielded and a grave released someone and heaven had now come to earth and earth and heaven were at the same place now because Jesus was standing there. And if I could take it one step further, Jesus turned to us and said, you're the temple. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus took the kingdom of God and moved it from this stone edifice, the temple, and now said, I am the temple. And then turned to his followers and said, you're the temple because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And I could, ooh, I could go on on that one for quite a while, but I'm, I'm going to. Maybe I won't. We get all torqued up at times because we pray for someone, and what I prayed, what I declared, what I said doesn't manifest. The person that I prayed for for healing isn't healed. And I'm all worked up about it, and I go have my conversations with God, and I've done all that. I am the temple, but he is the presence. The Shekinah glory that dwells in me doesn't dwell in me for me. It dwells in me for you. But it's not if, if what I want to have happen doesn't manifest itself the way I wanted it. I'm still just the temple. He's still the presence. And if the manifestation is to show that heaven and earth are now connected, maybe at times I don't know enough to know what that connection needs to look like in this moment. What I, and I'm telling you this because I've done it. Oftentimes, my faith in praying for somebody to be healed isn't that I see myself as the temple and right now I realize I'm at a place where heaven and earth are interfacing together and God's up to something and he's invited me to come in and be a part of it. I, my faith is what's expedient. Your leg don't work, I want your leg to work. That's expedient because we got to get church wrapped up at noon. I am hungry and I want to go have lunch. Get healed, that's expedient. Well, you know, sometimes it does. Sometimes it does. But because it does sometimes doesn't mean it's right. I think somebody said something about that earlier. In entitlement, right? Just, I forget how you said it, but it was great. Yeah, go watch it. We'll look at it. Yeah, it was an awesome thing. But we, so, when, when I'm, when, if I am walking as a disciple and I now see myself as the temple, I am the place where heaven and earth, every step I take, heaven and earth are connecting through me, through you. Even when I don't feel connected, it's connected. I can't disconnect it. To disconnect it, I would have to take God out of me. 
And he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So even when I go, if you want to hang back today, I kind of want to do this one on my own. He's like, yeah, help yourself. I'm going with you anyway. You know. Or you think that he's not with you, and you turn the corner and you discover him standing there, and he scares the bejeebies out of you because, oh, my goodness. So it's a different way. We, you know, I, I want us to begin to see the way Hebrews see it. So 1 Chronicles 17, uh, 11 to 15. And when your days are fulfilled to walk with, let me back up. This is God speaking to David about what's to come. David wanted to build God a house. And God said, I have a better plan. I'll build you a house. But David, your house was going to be made with stones. My house, that's not the way I'm going to build a house. I'm actually going to build a family. That's the house I'm going to build you. First Chronicles 17, verse 11. When, your days, when the days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. I will not take my steadfast love from him as I took it from, from him who was before you. But I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. That wasn't Solomon. That was Jesus. It's one of the, the prophecies. Interesting enough, Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, Matthew picks up on this and says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus came. He is the son of David. So Jesus shows up at his very the announcement of his birth in coming into conflict with the powers that be. The, the ultimate cosmic showdown was underway. Matthew 12, 6 through 8. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That statement ticked a lot of people off. John 2, 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making, and making a whip of cords. He drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, these th take these things away and do not make my father's house a house of trade. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for, for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said then, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will do it in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So again, Jesus identified and said, I am the temple. And there's an interesting word play if you want to do, look between Old Testament verses and New Testament. Jesus also referred to is referred to and refers to himself as the stone. There's a lot of verses there. So there was another, another uh, way the Jews saw the stone and the way Jesus saw himself as a stone. 
So another thing about the temple that's interesting is the temple wasn't just a place where, you know, you went and you gathered and, and um, it was like the central point and where we believe God dwelled. The temple was also the bank. So all the finances of the nation went through the temple. They were all managed by the high priest and you know, there was the lesser people, the money changers and so forth. But the high priest, the aristocracy ran the temple in this time, in Jesus' time. Because the temple was the banking center, it was also the place where the writs of debt were kept. So everybody that owed, it was written in the temple. They were there on, in the records. There's several accounts of when revolts would happen, one of the first things that would happen when the revolt would come, they would go to the temple and they would burn all the debts. That was one of the first priorities. The minute you can capture the temple, burn the documents. Some things seem to never change, right? But again, let's put ourselves as just an average Jewish person living in Jerusalem at the time. So it was no different than a lot of things are now. The aristocracy, they had the nice homes. They were on the nice side of town. The high priest, they lived over there too. They'd worked their way up the food chain. They're doing well. They're full of success. But all the other folk, the working folk, the tradesmen, the craftsmen, they're all you know, on this side of town. But you would watch the well-dressed, the well-heeled, walking past you on their way to the temple to do what they did there. But that's also where my debts are stored. And I get notices about my debts. I can be, I can be prosecuted for my debts. I can have land taken from me because of my debts. I mean, you know, we all know what debts can do for us. That's why it's recommended don't be in debt. So... Um, the temple itself, for the average person, wasn't viewed as like the high holy place. It was also viewed as, what goes on in there? That doesn't always go well for me. And finally, so the, the temple represented... Um, so the temple represented where God lives. It also represents the banking. Or economic center. And finally, it also represented um, um, national, what did I, what did I, how did I write that? Yeah, it represented the nationalist movement, which we're all attempting to get to get all the um, invaders out. So I was looking to get the invaders out. So the temple became that place where the insurrection was also planned. And we, we know from watching the death of Jesus, the way the political and the religious would come together for something that was expedient Jesus' trial that brought before Pilate, the various things that took place during that time, there was a certain marriage of convenience. Now, again, if you're at this point in history, Rome had tight control over Israel. And, you know, there would be a high price to get paid, crucifixion generally, if you were found out to be leading an insurrection. So it wasn't... Um, um, you know, but that was going on. The temple and the temple system, that's where the insurrection 
was was taking place. Um, I'll touch on this a little bit more later. Uh, but in the battle for the temple, prior to Jesus, there had been one insurrection that was around the time of the Maccabees. And the leader, the, the king of the Jews, at that time was uh, Judah the Hammer. And his insurrection lasted about three years. And he was ultimately taken down and killed and his followers were, were executed. And then the, um, the next one was Simon the Star, which had happened shortly before Jesus came on the scene. It was another insurrection. It lasted approximately three years. And it actually ties into some of the other things that Daniel was prophesying. One of the things with um, Simon the Star, once he coalesced power and began to assemble the insurrection, he also started minting coins. Now, for Jewish coins could not have pictures of faces on them, right? Because you can't, that would say, broke the law. But what they did have were pictures of other things. And so he began to mint coins and minted coins for three years. And then ultimately, he too was put down. And so when Jesus, when Pilate said, put over him on the cross, king of the Jews, that wasn't some random statement that he just thought was a cute statement. Pilate was saying, we did it to them, we did it to them, and now we're doing it to you, king of the Jews. Rome is superior, and we will put down any insurrection that comes against God, Caesar. It wasn't just some random plaque. And that's why the Jews said, no, 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 you can't say that. He didn't say king of the Jews. He said he thought he was king of the Jews. He was never our king. And Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. And it stayed. But it wasn't random. And it wasn't just a, you know, Pilate being smart. It was Pilate making a political statement. We killed that group, we killed this group, and now this guy's come along, and we'll look at this more next week, but this guy's come along, and he doesn't act like any of the other ones because they raised up a group, and they chose violence to try to overthrow us. This guy, he's got some other thing going. He, like, shows up and says he's the Prince of Peace. Well, we go... So when he's arrested, the worst that happened is a guy got his ear cut off, and then the guy put it back on. <laughs> we don't even get what's happening here with this guy. You know, and then he stands next to Pilate, and Pilate says, you know, hear God, who is now being murdered by men. If we kill the son, then we get it all. It was the final showdown of this cosmic battle. And Pilate stands there and goes, well, what is truth? <laughs> Who are you? Don't you know? I mean, look at you. You're a bloody pulp. I hold you in my hand. And this still absolutely is beyond me in human terms. Jesus says, you don't have any power except what's been given to you. <laughs> Pilate, just understand something. If I want to, I can walk out of here. But that's not my assignment. Because God is now in charge. And his kingdom doesn't function like your kingdom. His kingdom doesn't need an army to suppress and to kill and to destroy. His kingdom moves by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. His kingdom is based on love. Pilate, you don't know what truth is? Truth is love, and you'll never know what truth is. Because yeah. love's standing right next to you, and all you can do is kill it. 
your only way of dealing with it. And I've gone way too long. Um, but I'll, I'll just close with this thought, and I'll pick up here next. If I'm the temple, was it Psalms 20, 20, 22? Swing wide, O ye gates. Let the king of glory come in. If I am the temple, and we talked about it today, and we were encouraged to do it today, have I swung wide the gates? Have I said, king of glory, come in? And in doing that, have I really said, not my will, but yours be done? Or am I still living in the, as we were exhorted, am I still living in the world of entitlement where I want God to come to make my dreams come true? God is not Disney World. He's come that I can be made that you can be made a temple and live and breathe as the interface between heaven and earth where God is, not where he occasionally shows up. How wide, how wide are our gates? Father, thank you. Um, thank you for being you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you. Um, thank you for putting up for feeble attempts to describe who you are. You are the king of glory. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You are the creator that lives in the midst of your people. Jesus, you are the true temple a temple not made by the hands of man that anybody could boast. But you are the gift of a loving father given to express him even though we murdered you. So today, as we celebrate Palm Sunday, let us wave our palms not with the expectation that a king with a military is coming to conquer, but we really raise the branches in celebration that God has come and is in charge, and the Satan has been destroyed. And the accuser of the brethren has been put down. And whosoever will may come. And he's also a guy that really likes to party and says that he parties every time somebody says yes. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm done, thank you.